liaising and then uh, writing the emails. Just to give an update, which really was the more important part of my job, probably someone else could have hung the ribbon. Uh, ultimately, I figure, but but being as I had been in the community working there for, for 12 years and knew the folks, I figured it was important to, to do this role uh, and speak honestly about how tough it was going at the time. Um, this was the day after the the day after the fire jumped. Just trying to update though people like you know like say we still have the guard where you know it's most important at the north end of the fire etc. We had up to 100 people at that point. Uh, more resources because the fire was scaring us a little bit more, costing everyone a little bit more. Still no evacuation alert on the community. This is not an interface fire at this point. In fact, I don't think it ever was officially an interface fire to jump ahead, but it was close to the community. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Talking a bit about the fire crews and just giving people, people want the story of who's working on a fire. Are they local guys? Do they know what they're doing? Are they communicating with each other? Like, and, 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 you, and I, I never was on Facebook, but I kept hearing Facebook says it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I, when I started hearing what, what's popping up on Facebook, it's like, okay, we, we better be providing some more information because it was a bit of a, I think there tends to be. I noticed by being thrown in, there's a bit of an information vacuum. People want a lot of information. If there's a fire in their backyard, they want to know, and they weren't getting enough information. So I just started to give more information. Not a ton, okay, but more. Um, uh, at this point, the incident command folks from Australia came in to help support the fire from an administrative perspective. Those two guys there in the yellow. Uh, just more briefing, more of a very Focused firefighters. More fire guard going up the ridge here, uh, east east here of Creek. Well, this is the, basically, you know, despite 100 people and three million dollars and and, and and all the work, you know, it was the rain on that day of August 13th that that saved our bacon, as far as the community goes. Um, we got uh, probably close to an inch of rain over two different rain events in two days. Luckily, Harrop got more than Proctor, got more than Nelson, and we just got really lucky with the fire. Uh, Settle it down uh, for a while. This is now mid-August. Went for a little hike. This is just a little bit of a, a burn in the back. This is in West Arm Park, actually, in behind uh, the fire, in behind the community forest. Then we had a wind event. Uh, the winds had been really light through the whole fire. The wind blew over the ridge into Narrows Creek. That's Narrows Creek there, Upper Narrows Creek. Uh, this just shows you the context of how close we, where the fire is to town. The fire moved from, from the back, where, uh, back end of Narrows four kilometers forward in one windy afternoon. So the fire went from eight kilometers from town to four kilometers from town in a few hours, and that was the day that everyone was on evacuation alert on August 31st. Uh, why, why evacuation alert? It's still quite a few ways from town. I don't know if this is actually our ferry, but this is just to remind everyone that the only way you're getting off this hillside is swimming, getting in your own boat, or waiting for the ferry. Right? The ferry holds 20 cars. Right? There's a, and I'm not an, an evacuation person or a tactical person, or whatever, but you got to be extra uh, cautious in those situations. Um, Again, giving a little more information about what was going on with contingency plans. We had to lay out some more plans for fire guard because uh, now it's in a whole new valley with no fire breaks ahead of it. Uh, this is just a sampling. I went through my emails a few nights ago to see all the emails that I was getting and were trying to respond to at night. Here's one, two, three, four, five, or six of them. One of them from Ramona and one from, from, from others. Just um, giving a sense of... of, of the kinds of issues that people have, just, you know, should I be coming home from the coast, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of appreciation for the work that I was doing, uh, communicating with folks. So this is what we ended up having to do when the fire jumped. Don't worry about the details, but, but this, is a, this is a fire guard that was built over uh, Labor Day weekend, over the, for, over the three days after the fire jumped. So now we've had to move way forward because there's no defensible space between where the fire is and the community. Uh, the, the, it's like, do we have to pull back that far? Yeah, we've got to pull back that far because we're just not going to stop it. 
between where Greg mentioned. Just to get in here, of course, here's Nelson, right? So here, here's the size of the fires that we can, that we're getting. And then here's where our communities are. And luckily those fires are still up the hill, uh, or have been so far. You know, here, Nelson's working on fire guards right here. I'm just gonna throw, show really quickly, that's Mill Lake, that's what it looks like now for those of you who hiked into there. It'll be pretty in a couple of years. Uh, this is the 2003 fire, that's last year's fire. Luckily the riparian area did not burn. Uh, well, not like just luckily, it is a riparian area. Uh, this is what some of the soils look like. That's pretty bad, that's pretty bad. That's along Mill Lake actually, the Lake Trail. Here's our intrepid uh, geotech hydrologist specialist looking uh, um, up Mill Lake. It actually was, the fire was still burning, but it was snowing up in the headwaters there. Um, just needles from hemlock trees protecting the ground, luckily. Testing for hydrophobic soils. This is Mill Lake from, from satellite image. That's just with some uh, color enhancement with the near infrared to show what burned and what didn't burn. So here's the final uh, map of the fire intensity. Like for an eco fire ecologist might look at this and say, wow, that looks awesome. Because the red <laughs> is your intense and your yellow is your moderate and then there's some brown there, you probably heard some light you can't see that's low and then some unburned patches. Actually quite a nice mosaic if you step way back and don't, don't think about what the panic situation was uh, beforehand. We decided to have a community celebration in November very well attended. The local uh, uh, volunteer fire department were there as well as some of the wildland fire folks. And here we have this is this is this is this is a fireweed coming up while the fire is still burning. Right, this ecosystem is coming back. This is natural. This is just where it burned to the ridge and, and did not go over. Thank goodness. Okay, real quick, Air Proctor. That's okay. That's the story of the fire. Real quick, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to talk real quick about our, our climate change adaptation project. Before, as it so happens, has been working on a climate change wildfire uh, preparation adaptation project for a few years. And we're looking at the risks to the community, including fire, to homes, water, biodiversity, and timber. We're developing strategies right now around fuel breaks, silviculture strategies, including stocking standards, where we convert our species to different species, like you've been hearing from others earlier. And there's a big community discussion part, arguably very well enhanced by the fire. And, uh, and there's an outreach component with other licensees. These are just a few very quick examples of, you know, this is your classic understory wildland river interface treatment. We've been planting ponderosa pine to try to anticipate drier climates. Uh, this is a landscape level fuel break that we started about 10 years ago along one of the ridges, uh, which was, uh, this is where the road ended for the fire. Now the, now the fire break goes another kilometer and a half south thanks to emergency efforts in the fire. So we're working on our fire breaks. Uh, that's what we're aiming for some of our landscape to look like now, because it's all 100-year-old fire origin forests and, and it's way, way too dense. Just a couple of maps. We've started to map our, our, our fuels. This is using LIDAR, just red is a lot of fuels, a lot of dense forest. Green is, is not so much. This is your very typical low elevation forest in Eric Proctor, right? That's, that's why we're worried because it's unbroken expanses of this. Here's a sort of initial probability of high intensity fire map that Paul Bradley and I have been working on the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but essentially it just takes the fuels and how dry is the site and crosses them and, and, and tries to look at where we have likely high probability. Of, if a fire was going in that area, how hard would it be to suppress? Well. It's on a dry site, there's tons of fuels, and we are talking fire season here. It's probably be pretty hard to suppress. I think the most significant thing is that everywhere close to town, except for our cut blocks, which are mostly partial cuts, uh, are all really high. Here's just a few pictures of our, of our various uh, logging shows slash fuel reduction treatments. Um, that's actually a 40% reduction. Uh, so there's a road right here and cable garden corridors right here. We're able to pull that off right in a EQO, visual quality objective retention. That's a low retention area. This is another sort of seed tree type cut. And this is just uh, me scratching.
scrambling to put together, put my different pieces of part of our landscape level climate change adaptation project is to look at fuel breaks at the landscape level for the whole community forest. So here's the fire. Here's the fire guards we built, and that's the one that we extended up into here. Uh, we're working on a large fuel break project with West Arm Park over on the west side of Proctor in this general area. Uh, there's been little fuel treatments here and here, and there's one coming up here. Uh, we're looking to try to put something in here, here, and these are ridges. Maybe try to get something up there um, to, 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 to talk about the fire shed sort of concept. Uh, we don't have all of these yet, but that's where we'd like to be before the next fire comes. Okay, this, uh, this is a little bit more esoteric, but just a reminder for those of us who are foresters and managers that, that our concept of risk is not exactly the same as other people's concept of risk. And it depends on what your values are, whether your values are timber or water or homes or what they are. You find your risk differently, just a reminder. And that the public, quote unquote, view risk differently from professionals, quote unquote. Um, natural risks are viewed differently from management induced risk, which means people are generally, from a psychological perspective, more likely to accept a natural risk than one that we put upon ourselves. But when we put upon ourselves building road into a watershed to reduce the fire risk, you know, we've got to have that conversation. We sometimes have to take some management induced risk to reduce a, a larger natural risk. Okay, very quickly, lessons learned. We were able to make some quick decisions on the fire. Uh, I think they paid off in getting the fire guard started. I learned, like I knew in theory, but learned in practice that if you have no access, you will not get resources. If you don't get resources, you're not fighting the fire. And I, that's from the perspective of a community forest that has very little access, uh, meaning, meaning road access and roads like them or not are kind of critical, at least some kind of access. Terrain, obviously highly limiting. <laughs> Uh, in our case, communication I already talked about. Pre-existing relationships, knowing the district manager, knowing the fire zone person, knowing the people on the water boxes, that obviously the, the directors of Community Forest, when, when I know who's phoning, when they're phoning, uh, and we can quickly uh, address a concern um, because we already know each other personally. And that I would just say obviously that the trust was essential for making those quick, tough decisions like putting machine across a creek and within a few hours notice. Okay, expect more of that, just we already know that from earlier today. Expect more of this. This is just pretty much an average fire, frankly, I think, for, for, the, for the current and the future Kootenays. Um, Pre-planning, so Hare Proctor is trying to run all of our forest management through the lens of climate change and fire, right? Um, so we're trying to integrate all of our forestry um, through these lenses. That means uh, where do we go, uh, how much do we cut, how much do we leave, what do we try to protect, that sort of thing. Landscape level fuel breaks are, I already talked about. I think bang for your buck, investing at least in planning, if not development of, of some of those ridge accesses, the old uh, fire road concept might be uh, helpful. We need to adapt all of our plans, our stocking standards, our timber supply assumptions, like we were talking about earlier, to the new reality. And I think that the nice thing about the story here is it's a community forest. The community started out 20 years ago, and for those of you who don't know, largely opposing logging. And now we have a very strong community consensus to use logging as a tool to reduce the fuels to, to protect the community. Not 100%, but I put 99. Thank you.